It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about language learning, <laughs> affect in language learning. Uh -huh. I'd like to begin with some facts. Fact. Many students lack motivation and make little progress in learning. Many other students <coughs> show enthusiasm in the classroom and learn the language well. More fact, sometimes no matter how hard we prepare our classes, our material, our classes are unsuccessful. In fact, sometimes we can experience the magic of seeing deep and lasting learning going on in our classes. And here today, I'm going to explore why I think the difference between each pair of facts has to do with our topic, affect. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a little bit of a cold today, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> affect refers to a wide range of phenomena that have to do with emotions, moods, dispositions, and preferences. And research tells us in classes where the affective aspects are taken into consideration, students have a higher self-concept, achieve more academically, and cause fewer discipline problems. This isn't anything new. <clears throat> In this class, nearly a hundred years ago, the students all learned a lot and were very pleased with their classes. And this I know because the student under the heart was my father. And this was taken nearly a hundred years ago and he, many times he talked to me about his classes, his teacher and how he really enjoyed it. And I asked him, well, why are you always talking about her in your class? And he thought for a moment and said, well, I think I would have to say it's because she cared for us. She was concerned about us and she helped us. She really helped us learn. I like this sentence by Aristotle <laughs> many centuries ago. He said, educating the mind without educating the heart, affect, is not educating at all. And the neuroscientist today, Joseph Ledoux, tells us the mind without affect isn't really mind at all. And the well-known Spanish neuroscientist, Francisco Mora, who's so well-known he often appears on television, he tells us in his book, Without emotion, there is no curiosity, no attention, no memory, and no learning. True or false? Teaching equals learning? Let's see what these two little fellows say. One of them is talking about his dog, and he says, I taught Spot how to whistle. The other one says, I can't hear him whistling. And then the first one said, I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. So teaching may not be always the same as learning. Here we have a class, a typical uh, teacher in control of everything, not really even thinking about his students, just talking about what he's teaching. And we can see that some of his students look bored and some may almost be asleep. And here's a different class. Everyone participated, interested, and certainly a lot more learning going on. And these have to do with um, <clears throat> some of the results of an important uh, World Innovation Summit for Education, uh, where they discussed what schools will be like in 2030. Teacher friend in class will disappear. And the teacher's main objective will be to guide students in their own learning process. Students will interact with each other and with the teacher in a process of collaborative learning. Now, teaching is the art of changing the brain, according to Dr. James Yall. But in order to teach, we need to connect with our students' brain. And some of the things we can do for this, the keys for connecting with the brain of the learner, are for the learner to feel comfortable and to be interested. And all these things are connected with affect and language learning. This is an important quotation from Professor Earl Stevek, who uh, 
at the beginning of the last century did very much for establishing things about language, foreign language learning. And he wrote, success in language learning depends less on materials, techniques, and linguistic analysis. Not that these aren't important, but he said, success depends more on what goes on inside and between the people in the classroom. Here he's referring to what really means affect in language learning. The inside are the individual factors, motivation, anxiety, etc. between the relational factors, between teacher and student and between students. This is also reflected in the important document, the Common European Framework of Reference, where they talk about the competences that we need to take into account as teachers. And one is the existential competence, which includes all things here related again to affect and tells us specifically, these factors are very important as they affect not only the language users, learners roles in communicative acts, but also their ability to learn. Now, what does all this have to do for our classes? Well, if we are concerned with affect, sometimes we're going to introduce some activities to support this, to support care for our students. For example, we're going to compare two activities now. Here's a typical textbook activity. Students are going to talk to the person next to them. And um, one is going to pretend they're a shop assistant in a pet shop. And the other wants to buy a tropical fish, ask how much it costs, how to take care of it, etc. If we analyze this according to the characteristics of a good activity, it has personal meaning for students, absolutely none, unless they have a tropical fish. It takes into consideration <coughs> mind, yes, because they have to construct correct sentences. But emotions in the body, the other two parts of us, nothing. It offers choice, very little. It improves classroom dynamics. It helps learners get to know each other, no. We can compare this to another activity, Gertrude Moskowitz called FIRE. Here we tell our students, you go home today and when you get to your home, you see it's on fire. <coughs> oh, but fortunately, your family is safe outside, your plants, your tropical fish, all safe. But in your window, there's a fireman who says, I can save only one thing because the house is going to fall. So you need to think of all the things in your house, what do you want me to save? So they each think of this and then they tell the person next to them of all their things, what they would save in this situation. Then the two of them get up and each of them tells uh, some of the other students in the class what their partner would save in this situation. And if we analyze this according to the characteristic of a good activity, it fulfills all of them very well. Okay, now I like this quote by educator Parker Palmer. He tells us, technique is what the teacher uses until the real teacher is there. So to, do, to know and to do is part of being a good teacher, but above all, to be how we are with our students. And I like Adrian Underhill's model of evolution in language teaching in two. Uh, he says, first of all, there are lecturers who have knowledge of the language so they can teach. Things don't go too well, so they learn a little bit about methods they, uh, and become what he calls teachers, but still nothing works as well as uh, they would like. So they continue to learn, to ask other teachers to read, to go to courses and become what Underhill calls facilitators who also have, besides knowledge of language and the methods, also have ways, knowledge of ways to create a psychological atmosphere which helps high quality learning. And this includes the consideration of what happens inside and between the people in the classroom. 
Now, how do we get to be a real teacher or a facilitator? There are many steps, but today we're just going to look at three. First of all, after a class that didn't go well, what would you do? Complain to your colleagues, put in a bad mood, blame the weather, eat chocolate. Well, then these reactions help you know what can help. Well, our first step, reflection. The process of reflection, reflection is think of something that didn't go well. Remember all the details. Think of different explanations for what happened and decide what could be changed so things would go better another time. A second step, which you'll hear more about today, is empathy. In English, we say, put yourself in someone else's shoes, which basically means to try to understand the other person, to consider them, their feelings, their thinking, try to understand what they are like. And an activity I like to do is this. I make a little card like this for each student and they have, I give it to each one, to each one, they write down their name, but nothing else. Then they exchange their card with the person next to them. And the other person tries to use empathy and put themselves in their, their colleagues' shoes and answer the other questions. Then they give them back and they talk about these and they have a lot of fun doing this. Also, I like to teach the language of empathy. So they will have language to use in, this, in these situations. Uh, positive situations, how wonderful, I'm glad. Negative situations, oh dear, I'm so sorry, etc. Then I prepare different cards and hand out one card to each of them. It has two good things on it and two bad things. They select one of them and then with a, a, another person, a classmate, they discuss this as if this were their real situation, as if they had just met Meryl Streep. Um, or uh, a car has run over your cat, oh no. And then the other person gives uh, an empathic response using the language and anything else they can. Now, a third step, what's the mistake in this English conversation class in Seville? Mary, what did you do last weekend? I go to a party and met George Clooney. Teacher, no, I went to a party. Pedro, what did you do last weekend? What's the real mistake here? Of course, the student made a little mistake with the verb, but she met George Clooney at a party. And in a conversation class, this would give them a lot to talk about, and they would all be interested. So here, the teacher didn't pay attention, didn't do active listening, a third step. To do empathize, listen with attention to what the teacher is saying, show interest and understanding, and stay with the teacher, speaker, don't interrupt. I like the Chinese verb for to listen which has these elements, ear, you, eyes, undivided attention, and heart. I think that explains very well what it is to really listen. Okay, now we're going to look at the aspect of between the people. Vygotsky said that learning is first intermental between minds that interact. And the class needs to be a learning community where students know and respect each other. There is interaction among them. They share goals. There are opportunities for social contact as well as for getting linguistic information. Professor Bremfit tells us that to use the new language in class, learners need to pay attention to many things. The language, of course, but also personal needs and social needs. Some teacher might say, why am I going to worry about other things? I teach grammar, vocabulary, etc., and that is enough. To this teacher, I would say, do you really want your students to learn the language? There are 
important reasons to be concerned, not only about the language, but about what goes on between the people in the classroom. Because alert yet relaxed students learn better and students find it easier to speak in an emotionally secure atmosphere and to learn to speak the language they need to speak. Now, according to Earl Stevek, teaching is centered on the learners, but teachers are the main figure in each classroom because they are who create the interpersonal aspect. So as teachers now, we can be part of the group and sometimes it can be useful to share something about ourselves with our students. So an activity I like to do is this. Secrets, things that are true about me, but they're secret, you can't see them, and lies, things that are false. So I put a list of these on the screen and then I, ask students, I read each one and ask students to raise their hand if they think the sentence was, is true. Then I go back and I read them again and tell them if they are true. For example, I was born in Las Vegas. I never lived there, but I was born there, so it's true. I play the guitar for concerts. I play the guitar a little bit, but I've never had a concert, so this is false. I know Rafa Nadal. I watched him on television a lot, but I don't know him, so this is also false. I've been to the tomb of Elvis Presley, true. I've always had a dishwasher, false. If I had, I wouldn't be here today, but that's a story for another time. My son works in movies in Spain, true. Okay. Now, I like to think of our groups as having a life that evolves. <coughs> it's different in different moments. At the beginning, what I call pleased to meet you or breaking the ice. The activities for breaking the ice, they help learn others' names. They have students speaking at least briefly with several others and they include personal information. They reduce anxiety and inhibition. Okay, so uh, an activity I like to do to help us learn the students' name at the names at the beginning, I have them sit in a circle and they're going to do this. They're going to say their name three times. First time, my name is true, but I tell a lie. So Juan, Pedro, and Ana would say these things that are, their names are true, but they're telling a lie, that they something they've invented. Then we go around again, and the person on their right asks them a question about their lies. Then the third time they go around, they say their name and something that is true about themselves. So then we've heard their names three times and we've also learned a little bit about them, something about them. Also at the beginning of a class, working together, uh, activities that help the group become a real group. If we use activities to have them work together. What research says, learning a language is by its nature a collective enterprise and the process is more effective when the class works as a unified group. Now, one thing I like to do at the beginning, I take quotes from important people, very, very nice quotes. And I take each of these quotes and I put them on a little, I print them on different colored pieces of paper. And then I cut them up in little pieces and hand them out to students as they come in to class that day. 
then what they have to do is find other people with the same colored paper and they see what their important quote is. And then to, they work together to decide a way to present it creativity, create, creatively to the rest of the class. When I have students working in a group, after they finish doing something, I like to have them do this sometimes to find things they have in common. And so I give them a list of things uh, and have them try to find things that they share here. They say like visit, something they do at the weekend, they like to do, so forth. Now, at the end of the course, I think it's more important, other than just giving the students an exam and saying, okay, that's all. Uh, we say goodbye at the end, yes, but we continue, we consolidate what has been learned and build bridges towards the future. Creating, uh, we can, what we can do then is to generate a positive feeling about the efforts made during the course, congratulate the class on their achievements. And the learning process hasn't finished, so we can consider plans for continuing to learn the language. Now, hmm, in these classes, which one do you think students are going to learn better, A or B? Certainly in B. And this has to do with something called teacher confirmation, which Professor Ellis tells us is the process by which a teacher communicates to students that they are significant valued individuals. Research has shown it has an important influence on students' motivation and their learning. Confirming behavior according to things that one of my students at the University of Seville uh, investigated for her doctoral thesis she interviewed many, many, many students and asked them what kind of behavior on the part of their teachers would lead to this feeling of being confirmed. The main things were they transmit feelings of confidence in students, smile, make eye contact, show interest in answering students' questions, take personal interest in students, listen students. This can all lead to more motivation, as she found in her thesis. Now, anxiety inhibits learning, of course. According to Tobias, with speaking or writing, the language doesn't get out. With listening or reading, language doesn't get in. Anxiety affects our neurons. On the left, we see what our neurons are like in a normal state, but when we're stressed, we see that they're reduced. So anxiety can affect our neurons, which affect our thinking. Ways to reduce anxiety. <clears throat> we can eliminate what causes it, if possible. We can talk to our students in a way that doesn't create anxiety or we can help students deal with it. For example, when we're going to have an exam, an exam often creates anxiety, but we can help students <coughs> prepare for it, uh, give them practice exams, so they will feel less anxiety then. Now, advantages to working with the group, are these only for students? When students are pleased with their learning, we teachers also enjoy our work more. Working with the between, the interpersonal dimension, creating a community of learning can enrich and bring enthusiasm to the life we live in our classes. <coughs> and Doña Ushioda tell us that if teachers are motivated to teach, there is a good chance that their students will be motivated to learn. <laughs> now, we're going to look at the inside the person, the individual factors. 
One of the most important of these is motivation, which has a great effect on learning. Motivation leads to action, leads us to take action, and this leads us to success with our learning. <coughs> Noam Chomsky uh, tells us that the truth of the matter is that about 99% of teaching is making students feel interested in the material. <coughs> now, working with verbs in the past tense, does this student look interested in her activity? Not at all. But we can easily find something a little bit different. A Beatles song, for example, they need to find out all of these things in the past. Okay, um, <clears throat> now something that is fundamental in learning. Sometimes the fun comes before the mental. And so we can do activities that are fun in the classroom. We can't see this all on the screen here, but um, the activity is, what did Lydia do yesterday? An activity by Danielle Martin. And this is also to work with verbs in the past tense. So what I do, I have students, one student come to the front of the room and they are not going to, the student is not going to look at the screen. And then I'm going to project things that Lydia did yesterday. And they are going to and try, without saying anything, try to show the student who can't see this what Lydia did yesterday. She read a book, or she ate spaghetti, or she washed her hair, and so forth, several things. And they have a lot of fun with this. Now, true faults. Students who think they can't learn the language are right. This is true unless they change that belief. And this has to do <clears throat> with our self concept, <clears throat> how we see ourselves, and our self esteem, how we feel about this. And both greatly influence learning. Now, we are all born with an I'm okay. None of us are born with low self-esteem. But there are many enemies of self-esteem in the world. And sometimes these can affect our students and they may not have good self-esteem when they get to our classroom. One project, a research project in, at, the university in, at a university in England by my colleague, from uh, Argentina, Veronica de Andres. She was going to teach her students, they were young students, teach them English, but at the same time incorporate in the teaching activities, some activities that supported their self-esteem. And for her project, she had them draw a picture of themselves at the beginning. This student doesn't look very happy, does he? And how about this student? He looks 
very pleased and happy. The interesting thing is they're the same student at the beginning and the end of her project after she had included some activities dealing with self-esteem. And the student wrote at the end, I learned that I am normal. Now, Professor Robert Reisner has a model of five components of self-esteem that we can deal with in our classroom. Security, identity, belonging, purpose, and competence. Veronica Dandress and I use this in our book, Seeds of Confidence. The, single, the five senses, the sense of security, we can deal with this uh, and it leads to confidence based on physical security and emotional security. Students with a sense of security feel more comfortable, take more risks and can concentrate their energy on the task and they participate more. Now, how we deal with mistakes can influence students' sense of security. Correcting a mistake can contribute to their belief they can't learn, or it could open a window to learning and give them confidence if we correct a mistake well. <clears throat> and one thing, help them get rid of their fear of making mistakes, because when we learn a language, we always make mistakes. I put quotes on the board. I print up quotes by well-known people where they deal with mistakes in a positive way. Mistakes are portals of discovery. The only people, scientific or other, who never mistake, never make mistakes, are those who do nothing. Freedom is not worth worth having if it does not include the freedom to make mistakes. And Caleb Gatenio said, a mistake is a gift for the class. Then I have them, I put about eight of these quotes on the, on the wall, and then I have them go to the one they like best and stand there. And the other students who choose this also, I have them tell each other about a time they made a mistake on something in their life. And to help them, I tell them about a mistake I made, and this is true. When my children were young, I was so busy. I was always running around. And one day I got to my classes at school and I saw that I had one shoe that was net black and one shoe that was brown. Not only that, one had a heel like this and the other a heel like that. And this is, as I said, this is true. So then they try to stop worrying about making mistakes. Sense of identity. Don Quixote uh, said to Sancho Panza in the novel, the great novel, you must keep in view what you are, striving to know yourself, the most difficult thing to know that the mind can imagine. The sense of identity refers to the knowledge I have of myself. It is knowing who I am and what I can become. It includes a realistic vision of my strengths and my areas to develop. Teachers who promote the sense of identity, celebrate the uniqueness of individuals, promote the development of a positive self-concept, their acceptance of students and interest in them as people, and help students recognize their strengths and their points to be developed. An activity I like to do is this. I give them um, a card like this. And in groups of three or four or five, they uh, sit down and they have a coin and they toss the coin. And if it comes up heads, they move one box. Or if it comes up tails, they move two. And then they talk about the thing that is there, a goal I have, a value that's important, a place that's special, something about themselves. They each do this and then they go around again and again until they get to the end. The sense of belonging exists when we feel accepted in a group. Our brain is social and we need to connect with others in an atmosphere of respect to learn most effectively. 
teachers who promote the sense of belonging create a climate of acceptance and support interpersonal relationships in the class. The sense of competence is knowing that if we work, we can reach our goals. Teachers who promote the sense of competence offer options or alternatives to help students learn, provide incentives and support, and give useful feedback, and celebrate achievements. So this is teaching for success. With activities and taking these things into consideration, we can plant seeds, seeds of confidence. And this is important because classes with anxiety, without motivation, without active participation, without personal meaning for students are classes without learning. I like this quotation by Professor Leo Van Leer, using only the textbook greatly limits your capacity to participate in innovative and creative teaching. So this means that it can be very useful for us to sometimes prepare an activity of our own. Doesn't have to be long, maybe two, three, four minutes even, but just to do something different can be very important for our students. As David Block tells us, students appreciate teachers who carefully prepare their classes and the use of your own materials shows clear evidence of preparation. Now, there's not only one recipe for learning, not only one way that students learn because brains are different. And so there are advantages to working with different ways to learn greater interest and relevance in what we teach, an increase of students' responsibility for their own learning. And this has to do with the model by Howard Gardner of multiple intelligences. He tells us there are many ways that we learn through contact with a lot of different things, eight different ways to learn that he discusses. And these can be brought into our teaching in different ways. For example, he mentions bodily and aesthetic intelligence. This is important because we have three parts of ourselves, cognitive, our thinking, our brain, affective, our feelings, but also physical, our body. And we need sometimes to move to learn. An article in the Spanish, uh, the, one of the best Spanish newspapers several years ago, described how movement is important for learning because it brings more intense brain activity, more oxygen to the brain, more connection between neurons and better concentration. So sometimes it can be useful to bring some kind of movement in. And one activity I like to do is to come into class <coughs> and tell students, today we have an important exam. They're all surprised because I hadn't said anything about this. But then I tell them, all right, the first question is this. If you were born where you live now, raise your right hand. If you were born somewhere else, raise your left hand. And I wait for them to do this. Question number two. If for your summer vacation, you want to go to the beach, look up. If you want to go somewhere else, look down. If you want to go both places, do both things. Third question on our exam. If today is Wednesday, stand up. And I wait for them all to stand up. Fourth question. If you would enjoy more going out with friends to going to the dentist to get a teeth pulled, sit down. And so they've done a little bit of movement here. <clears throat> I also like doing what I call go for a walk. If my classroom will, it, will this will be possible, I put things up on the wall for them to walk around and look at. Like our activity we talked about a minute ago about the errors in making errors in language learning. <clears throat> And one activity 
is this, I know what you are thinking. Here I put a series of images upon the walls of people doing different things in different situations. And then I have them walk around <clears throat> and without telling anyone which one they choose, choose one and decide what this person might be thinking at that moment. Then they sit down and they say their sentences and the class tries to guess which one. For example, if they say, <coughs> I wonder if it's going to rain today. Well, this might be four, or might be eight. Or if they say, hmm, I wanna know if my team won the game yesterday. Okay, this would be number five. And they have fun doing this. Now, if we, <coughs> if we look now at the visual spatial intelligence as one of, the, one of um, Howard Gardner's eight intelligences that is very important to take into account in language teaching. The visual spatial intelligence is very useful because if students have something to look at, this can help them and give them something to talk about. So one activity would be to project two different th images and have them with the person next to them, think about things that are different and things that are the same in both of these. Now, if I asked you, what all of these important things in the arts and sciences had in common, one thing would be that in their creative work, they all took into account mental images. Aristotle said, it's impossible to think without images. And John Dewey tells us, the image is the great instrument of instructions. What learners get out of any subject is merely the images they themselves form in regard to it. And Antonio Damasio, a well-known neuroscientist in Spain, he tells us a condition that is necessary for the mind is the ability to create images internally and to order those images in the process called thought. So activating mental imagery is having different sensory experiences without an external stimulus. For example, seeing with the mind's eye, hearing with the mind's ear, et cetera. And this can be important in the learner and learning process. For example, for memory, Alan Paivio tells us, a language needs to be learned and associated with nonverbal reference, visible or in images, which represent knowledge of the world. So if we are teaching Spanish students uh, English, rather than associate the vocabulary with what it represents in their own language, it's more useful if they associate it with what it represents. In our classroom, there are not many trees, so they need to associate this with a mental image. And this is going to help their learning their vocabulary. Motivation, according to Zoltan Dornier, the world expert on motivation, he tells us, I consider the concept of the ideal self, the strongest and most versatile mechanism for motivation. When we imagine our ideal self, how we would like to be, how we would like to imagine ourselves, the image of ourselves we would like to have, this helps us formulate goals for our future and to reach them. And Doug Brown writes about his visualization game. He says, imagine yourself speaking the language fluently and interacting with people. Then when you are actually in such a situation, you will have, in a sense, been there before. With our materials now, Charles and Jill Hadfield tells us if you don't have access to a lot of materials, and I would say even if you do, use the limitless resource of students' imagination. Simply get the students to close their eyes, 
to imagine their own pictures, which become the stimulus for speaking or writing activities. For example, something like this. Mary was in her home, in her apartment, looking out the window at the street below. It was raining. There were a lot of people running because they were getting wet, but many had umbrellas. She looked for a while, then she went into her room and sat down on her sofa. She continued to look at, over at the window to see the rain and also she began to cry a little about something. But suddenly the door opened and Charles entered. After I say that, then I start asking students to think about different questions, to write down a quick answer to these. And then I ask them, I ask several, how old is Mary? And they're all going to have different answers. They're not, none of them are going to be wrong because these are from the images that they had in their mind and these are correct. And here they've had an experience of listening, of writing and of speaking. The areas of language. We can work with vocabulary in different ways. One thing I've done with my students at the University of Seville in their language class, after reviewing a bit the vocabulary of animals and their habitats, I, ha I tell them to imagine, to close their eyes and imagine they see a little dog running around in front of them. They watch the dog and suddenly they see that the front stays the dog, but the back becomes like a cat. They continue watching and then they see that the back stays like a cat, but the front changes into a monkey. So then I tell them they need now to find in their mind a new animal. And they're going to work with this with their classmates. So uh, uh, with different types of animals, if they have any trouble, I might show them these pictures. Then what they're going to do is each one tells what new animal they found. And in their group of four or five, they're going to choose one and develop a presentation for this new animal. They're going to give it a name, tell where it lives, what it eats, what it does, and so forth. And then they're going to present this at an important uh, scientific conference, which is going to be the rest of the class. Each group will present their uh, new animal and its habitat. Now for grammar, also we can use images. Uh, working with the past tense again, uh, I tell students to write things down that they can think of about their childhood when they were young. Maybe toys, their favorite toys, if they had a pet, where they would go on vacations, what they like to eat, what would they do after school, and so forth. Then, <clears throat> with the person next to them, they're going to say, remember your childhood and tell me about and they will ask them about some of these things. Tell me about your favorite toy and so forth. <clears throat> and when I do this, since I like to share, I tell them about, I show them, I bring in my favorite toy and show them. Uh, this was my doll, Ginny, and her clothes were made by my mother many, many, many years ago, and I still have her. And so I bring her in to show my students and share something about me with them. With the four skills now, we can also use images. Professor Tomlinson says with reading, if students don't see mental images of what they read, it will be difficult for them to get a good understanding of the text and their experience of it will be superficial. With writing, if the teacher just says, take a piece of paper and write a text, their reactions might be, I don't know what to write. The blank sheet of paper scares me. So the use of mental images to, before they have to write to think about this in different ways can help to overcome the fear of the blank sheet of paper and lead to more interest and confidence and in more creative writing. 
And with speaking, an activity I like to do is this, a new you. Students here are going to invent a new you. They're going to imagine a new person. They're going to think of a new name for themselves, age, job, where they live, where they go on holidays, what makes them special, and so forth. They're going to do all of these things to get an idea of a new person. Then I have them in twos come up in front of the class and each of them is going to sit down with the other person. But since this is a, a cheap airplane, there are no movies, there are no uh, magazines, all they can do is talk with the other person. So each of them will talk to the other person in their new image. And they really enjoy this. Now, one last couple of last activities, an activity where both teacher and students have to think, have to think of images. The teacher starts out once upon a time, the student says something, and then the teacher has to take that and incorporate it into the activity. Once upon a time, there was a king, he was happy, plain, and so forth. He, they think of different things. Okay. Values. One last thing, I think it's very important for us to incorporate values at some point in our teaching. So I do this activity. I teach students, I review with them anyway, uh, a list of important uh, values. And then I also review with them how to present themselves to someone else, to shake their hand and how to say so, uh, but they're going to give their name using their first name but for their last name, they're going to use one of the values. So I give an example. I go up and shake one student's hand and say, hello, I'm pleased to meet you. My name is Jane Patience. And then they go around and they introduce themselves. And sometimes they introduce their friend with their new name too. Okay, one last image. Today, I'd like you to imagine you've taught the best class ever. Everything has gone very well. Your students have learned so much. They've enjoyed it. And you've enjoyed the class very much too. The bell rings, but it takes them a while to get up because they've enjoyed it so much. But when they do, many of them pass by your desk and tell you, we really enjoyed your class today. It was great. We learned so much. Imagine if it can happen. The end. Yes, this is the end of our session, OI. I hope it's just the beginning of many new adventures in the classroom. Thank you for attending our webinar. Thank you very much and good day.